Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Good evening, everyone. And a really, 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 really warm welcome to this Easter special. Um, we are excited tonight because we have some exceptionally good news to share with you all night. And we believe that um, Easter is the church's Christmas. It's the biggie. It's the one sort of where you go all out for it. Um, and I know that you will have all in here tonight heard a version of the Easter story over the years, sometimes many times. It involves a man. It involves a man, Jesus, on a cross, being tortured, punished, killed. And there's a good bit in there somewhere because he rises again. But what about that bit before? That awful, horrific, bloody lead up to all of that. What is that really all about? And you might think, well, why is it called Breaking Bad? You may have seen the TV show with the same name. You may not. You may like it. You may not. It really, really doesn't matter tonight because we're sharing it with you as a concept to have some great conversation and thinking about tonight. But just to give you a sense of the references in the TV series, I'm just going to give you a very brief summary of the show. Um, it centers around a man called Walter White, and he is a chemistry teacher whose life is on a trajectory, you know, he's got carrying on in his life, and then he gets some bombshell news. He finds out that he's being diagnosed with stage three terminal cancer, and he only has two years to live. Now, you can imagine it sends his head into a spin, and he thinks through, what am I going to do? I've got a wife. I've got a son. How am I going to provide for them? And really long story short, he ends up thinking, what am I good at? He's a chemist, and he connects with a former student of his, and he ends up um, embarking on a new business venture, creating and then selling a very high-quality version of the drug crystal meth. And of course, it raises incredible questions about morality and what's okay. If you're faced with a situation like that and you're desperate and your intention is to provide, is it all right to go on such a journey? It also raises questions about the other characters who might also have all sorts of things going on in their life that's morally quite questionable, but perhaps more socially acceptable. And this TV show raises all sorts of these questions. One such character is called Hank, and he is Walt's brother-in-law, and he's actually a police detective. And part of his job is to get the meth off the street. So, of course, he goes hunting down this Heisenberg who's having this impact, not realising that that's actually his brother-in-law, Walt's white alter ego. So, this all unfolds over many series. Now, I know what you're thinking. What has this got to do with Easter? Well, we are not in the business of getting meth off the streets of York tonight, but we are absolutely, passionately sold out in the business of getting myth off the streets of the church. And you might think, well, what myths do we want to dispel? There's been all sorts of myths, for all, sold for all sorts of reasons, with all sorts of motives, and we're not here to judge those tonight. But we do think they've caused far too much damage for far too long for far, to far too many people. And we really, really want to tackle some of that thinking tonight. That, those myths around our understanding of God and his attitude towards towards the world. I mean, is that really the story? Now, Walter White wants to make a crystal clear version of his product. And part of our intent tonight is to make the Easter and the symbolism of, symbolism of Easter absolutely crystal clear. Because could it be that it's beyond a story about a dealing with human badness? Is Easter just about human badness and how it was sorted out? Or is it more than that? When it says it is finished, is it it is finished but, it is finished if, it is finished when, or is it finished? And I know this is a terrible pun, but there's been a lot of myth understanding about Easter that we want to tackle tonight. 
Now, the second reason why we've called it Breaking Bad is because Breaking Bad is American slang for challenging convention. And there has been a conventional story, a common narrative around Easter for hundreds of years. And tonight, do we accept that conventional story or do we do some Breaking Bad? Are we willing? Because I don't know about you, but I am quite frightened at the thought that what I believe about God could have become my drug of choice that I'm addicted to, that I won't let anybody touch, that I won't let anybody mess with. And if there's myth in me tonight, I want it to be dispelled. And so my challenge to you tonight is, are you willing to have the myth that might have gathered around your life for all sorts of reasons? Are you willing to have some of that dispelled and to hear a real pure message if you are, you are going to have a cracking night because we are going to get the myth off the streets and you're going to enjoy music, dancing, singing, all in our endeavours to do that. And you are going to hear nothing but good news. So have a fantastic evening. How many of you watch Breaking Bad? <laughs> to the rest of you, I'm just a man in a silly hat. Keeping the spirit of it. For those of you not familiar, this is the Eisenberg hat, which Walter White decided to wear because he felt it made him look much more menacing. Because how can you have a successful drug dealer called Walter White? I mean, it's just not on, is it? So he changed his name to Eisenberg, got the shades and the hat. And for those of you who watch it, he was known as, he said, I am the one who knocks. So for some of you tonight, you need to know I am the one who knocks. For the rest of you, uh, this guy Eisenberg was known as the cook. That was what he was known by everybody in the business because he was the one who cooked that which was crystal to go out on the street. So tonight, I'm your cook. And we're going to try and cook something that's crystal clear to destroy some of the myth that Jenny talked about. Now, the first thing I need to do is take these off because I can't see a blooming thing. Not just because they're dark, but because they're an old prescription. <laughs> and the problem is, some of you can't see a blooming thing when it comes to Easter tonight because what you're looking at it through is an old prescription. So everything's blurred. So we're going to get a new set of shades tonight. Look after them for me, treasure. Thank you. All right, now, I appreciate what Jenny said. I thought it was amazing. Um, I'm going to do something tonight that I would not normally do on a given um, Saturday. Uh, I'm never short of a word or two. Um, but tonight I'm going to deal with, with three myths that we want to break. But I'm mostly going to read it to you. The reason I'm going to read it to you is because with such a delicate and established subject like Easter... Um, I want to be very precise in what I say and how I say it and why I say it because what I'm about to say I believe is important in dealing with these myths. So the first of the three myths that we want to deal with is the myth of separation. And here we go. At the core of developed thought on what the cross and death of Jesus were all about is the issue of man being separated from God by his badness. This forms the foundation for a series of beliefs that only hold weight because of that presumption. But is it true? Is it, a crystal, is it as crystal as some would have us believe? Did God turn away from us because, as some say, he could not look upon sin? In Jesus' great parable of the prodigal, the story about the boy who goes away and comes back again, did the father refuse to look at him until he cleaned himself up? Did he refuse to look at him until he phrased an extensive prayer of sorrowful repentance? Was his heart ever separated from his son? The story implies all the problem is with the boy and none with the Father. There can be no denying that death got into our world sometime, somehow, 
maybe that's the problem. We didn't really get separated from God by our behavioral badness. We just got separated from life in all its brilliant glory. Wasn't that what God was fixing at the cross? Wasn't death the enemy that needed defeating once and for all? Not the devil, not sin. When death is defeated, those things happen anyway. The underlying story of the Bible revolves around God never being separated from us. Only us separating ourselves from Him, with Him relentlessly pursuing us. The overarching story of the Bible is God's love, not His wrath. In the Genesis story, we read anger and divine wrath into the narrative when anger is not present. A declaration of consequence, yes, but that is wildly different to a declaration of judgment and punishment. It tells us of animal skins being provided to the humans by God to cover what had become the source of their shame, their nakedness, their sense of vulnerability. But, what, what, but was that sacrifice enacted for God's benefit or for theirs? Did God distance himself from humanity from that point on until the cross? The answer is an emphatic no, quite the opposite. This all poses questions about the nature and extent of forgiveness. What is authentic, true forgiveness? How love responds to adversity and rejection? And in the light of all this, who and what we were being saved from through the death of Jesus on the cross. If our imperfection measured against God's presumed perfection caused God to turn his back on us because a perfect holy God cannot look upon sin, if that invoked his wrath against us because he hates sin and sin is in us, if then, as some presume, God had to satisfy his wrath by Jesus' cruel death and that he is then okay because of that, then that gospel implies that Jesus came to save us from God. That would make God the problem, not sin, not death, God. That's a myth that we want to get off the streets. Yeah. All right, myth number two. <clears throat> The myth that Jesus saves us from God. Throughout history, wherever people have talked about the gods, there has been one distinct similarity. The gods are angry because of the behavior of humans. Their anger must be appeased. There must be a blood sacrifice to appease their anger. Favor is only bestowed as a reward for A, appeasing the God's righteous anger, and B, good behavior. And so, ritual sacrifice, often child, becomes the common way by which the gods are kept happy, or at least restrained from smiting their unworthy subjects. The general rule of thumb, you will be rewarded for doing good, you will be punished for doing bad. As much as the Christian church tries to make it appear otherwise, in its common narrative, this is the model presented and embraced by so many. God's wrath exceeds his love in that only if his wrath is satisfied can his love be given. The argument would be that God demonstrates his love for us by making Jesus the object of his wrath. That is, the, is Jesus absorbing the wrath of God that allows God to forgive us, really? And where actually is the forgiveness in that? If God needed the death of Jesus to forgive us, he didn't forgive anything. When a debt is paid, when your mortgage is finished, when your credit card is settled, no one will write to you saying, I forgive you. When you add into that the requirement to say sorry and ask God to forgive you before you can be truly forgiven, how is that forgiveness? Forgiveness granted in response to a sorry or some kind of repentance is retribution, not forgiveness. 
I appreciate there are many verses in the Bible that can be used to support numerous points of detail regarding the death of Jesus. Time, uh, 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 time and your interest make it something we can't deal with tonight. However, the interpretation of those verses depends on the lens through which you view not only the verses, but the overarching message of the Bible. The sad conclusion we are left with, if we interpret th things through the common model, is that we needed Jesus to save us from God. What if the truth of the cross is that Jesus saves God for us? By that I mean that Jesus removes God from the common image and requirements of the gods that we have created and shows him to be an ungodlike God. What if the blood of Jesus poured out at the cross was not primarily about cleansing and appeasement, but the making of a new, different, extraordinary covenant for humanity, saturated with divine forgiveness and pardon through grace that is obscenely good, scandalously benevolent, and powerfully life-changing, driven by unconditional love? I believe the purpose of the death of Jesus was to establish an eternal, unbreakable, unbreakable covenant with himself, of which we are the beneficiaries. The Bible calls this the new covenant. In the ancient world, the blood of revenge and retribution were very different to the blood of covenant. A sacrifice made not to make the recipient right, but to bring the recipient in. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 and 8, in him we have redemption through his blood, listen, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with what? In accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. That means that God fully understood who he was getting involved with, what that would entail, and how he would respond, and chose that it would be the riches of his grace. If the holiness of God is the governing factor in his behavior, then the creation of humanity as an indefensible act of cruelty, which should get the derision that it deserves. It would suggest that there are higher laws to which God must subject himself. The idea that God has a boss. We want to get this myth off the streets. All right, he's back. Quite liking the hat. To steal a phrase of Jesus, I and the hat are one. You will have observed tonight, if you are as observant as I think you are, that I have not used a lot of uh, Bible verses from Scripture in what I have said to you thus far. The reason for that is that very often in Christian circles, Bible verses can be tossed around like hand grenades in a war to see who can blow who up and blow whose idea out of the water. That's not for me to do tonight. That's for you to think about and decide whether these things be true. Uh, also because the favorite method of the religious leaders uh, when Jesus was around was to use scripture to challenge whether he was or was not the Son of God. So they used the Bible to try and prove to Jesus, the Son of God, that he was not the Messiah. He was not who he thought he was. He had not been sent by God. So there are many scriptures. I recommend that you go and read the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a lens on some common things that I think have become more mythical than true. So my third myth... <laughs> the myth that God has a boss. The argument goes, God cannot just freely forgive us because the righteous demands of the law must be fully met. 
because the wrath of God towards sinful man must be satisfied. Because justice demands that crimes are punished, not forgiven. Because we have a debt that needs to be paid. Because there is a ransom demanded for us. The terminology used here can all be found in biblical text, but what do we seem to think that they mean? Who owes what to whom? Who exactly is being paid by the death of Jesus on the cross? Ransomed from who or from what? Redeemed from where? Is God then subject to a system or framework that does not allow him to act arbitrarily to do just what he wants? Is he then subject to a higher law which he must be seen to serve? We have problems in our human thinking to separate the death of Jesus from a framework of legal and economic thinking. God's justice demands that payment be made in reparation for wrong done and damage caused, they say. Debts must be paid in full or the debtor must be subjected to the wrath of the one to whom he or she is indebted. We then interpret scriptures like Christ died for our sins through a legal or economic model. But where's the uniqueness? Where's the amazing grace so often sung about? The elements unique to the undiluted gospel, the good news, when freed from the shackles of superimposed ideas and images of what gods are like, are forgiveness freely given in response to nothing, and grace, favor given not as a reward for something done, but as a benevolence of unconditional love. Love in the courtroom is not a reality. The rule of law overrules love. Love determining the wheels of banking is a nonsense. The rule of economics overrules love. <clears throat> if justice required the death of Jesus, then God is answerable to a higher law. If God is answerable to a higher law, God is not the boss. Could it be that we have created the God that we need to satisfy our own need for justice? That the God we have created reflects how we would deal with us. That's why we then want the bliss of heaven for good people and eternal conscious torment for the bad. But if God is truly God, and God is love, he is neither answerable to a higher law of justice or to the contraction of his nature into some legal framework. Whatever the cross is therefore, it is not the evidence supporting these ideas. God is the boss. God is not answerable to a higher law. Robert Farrah Capon says, we will do almost anything to avoid putting faith in a God who doesn't come up to our standard of divinity. Grace is the ability of God to forgive without the need for sacrifice. I repeat again, therefore, that the primary purpose of the cross was covenant, not cleansing. Grace is the bomb, the crystal clear product which allows all to experience the already granted forgiveness of God without payment or reimbursement. Resurrection is the fruit of salvation. Death is done. Life conquers death. And love conquers all. Love wins. God wins. We win. Forgiveness invokes an immediate change to a person's status. It reflects who the one forgiving thinks that you are. The message of the gospel of Easter is that you will not be measured by the good or the bad that you do, but by the grace you accept. So accept grace. Get the myth 
off your street and receive something truly crystal. C H R I S T A L. Just one last thing from me before uh, the guys come to finish off. That's the message of Easter. It's the cry of the heart of God, not wrath, but love. It's the God who says, all I know is that I love you. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, whatever you think of yourself, whatever the shame, the guilt, the condemnation you carry, he has only one thing to say over you. I love you. And that's all I know. I said earlier that you will not be measured on the good or the bad that you do, but on the grace that you accept. So I accept grace. I want to pray just right now, very simple prayer, that tonight you may want to be a person who accepts that amazing grace, that wonderful grace that's obscenely good, ridiculously embracing, and can be yours tonight, that is the key to resurrection, and resurrection is life from the dead. Dead things live again. It's about people coming alive. That's the heart of the gospel. So I'm going to pray right now. If this is you, you just say in your heart to God, yes. Thank you for your love. Thank you that it's all that you know. Thank you that your grace is what you have given so not by our endeavors, but by your provision, we can have a restored relationship with you and resurrection life now. Let it be so in hearts, in this place, this night, in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.